Good evening. I'm Jonathan Capehart in for Joy Reid. We begin tonight with a slew of legal developments today on multiple fronts, all involving the many criminal cases of Donald Trump and his associates, starting with Peter Navarro, a former advisor in the Trump White House who just a short time ago was found guilty by a D.C. jury on two counts of criminal contempt of Congress for refusing to comply with a subpoena from the House January 6th Select Committee last year. In their closing arguments, prosecutors told jurors that Navarro, quote, thinks he's above the law, and in this country, nobody is above the law. In that same building, the grand jury that indicted Trump for election interference met today for the first time since handing up those charges more than four weeks ago, an indication that their investigation is ongoing, which could potentially spell bad news for the six unnamed co-conspirators listed in that indictment. Meanwhile, in Georgia, attorneys for Trump today notified the judge presiding over his criminal racketeering case that he may seek to move his state case to federal court, something several of his co-defendants are also asking for, though the judge has yet to issue a ruling. And Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis is proving once again that she is not to be messed with issuing a scathing rebuke to Republican House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan after he demanded that the DA hand over a series of documents related to her indictment of Trump. In her response, Willis did not hold back, accusing Congressman Jordan of overstepping his congressional authority and obstructing her prosecution, writing in part, your job description as a legislator does not include criminal law enforcement nor does it include supervising a specific criminal trial because you believe that doing so will promote your partisan political objectives. She goes on to say, your letter makes clear that you lack a basic understanding of the law, its practice, and the ethical obligations of attorneys generally and prosecutors specifically. There's a lot happening here, and here to discuss all of it, we have Somia Dayananda, former senior investigator on the House January 6th Select Committee, Renato Mariotti, former federal prosecutor, and Hugo Lowell, political investigations reporter for The Guardian. Thank you all very much for coming to the readout. Somia, I'll start with you as someone who was part of the House Select Committee's investigation. What's your reaction to the Navarro verdict? Well, I think for those of us who served on the committee, it's another day of accountability. And it's also a day of affirming the committee's work. Um, you know, we had the congressional authority to investigate the facts and circumstances that led to January 6th. And as part of that, we interviewed close to a thousand witnesses. And the vast majority of them came in and cooperated with the committee. And if they were going to assert a privilege, they did so in front of a committee staffer. As part of our fact-finding, Peter Navarro was identified as one of the key players who made efforts to overturn the 2020 election. So as part of the investigation, we had the authority to question him. We had the authority to subpoena him. And when he did not show up on that day, he was referred to the Department of Justice. So I think what viewers should be reassured by is that there was a process and that now it, by this verdict, we see that no one is above the law and that the common sense of D.C. jurors really held him accountable. And this is what we expect to see with additional trials in the future for uh, the former president and his allies. Mm -hmm. um, Renato, moving on to this brutal letter from Fonnie Willis to Jim Jordan, she goes on to write that if Congress were to follow through on their threats to deny this office federal funds, you will be deciding to allow serial rapists to go unprosecuted, hate crimes to be unaddressed, and to cancel programs for at-risk children. She also listed a number of suggestions for pr productive activity by the Judiciary Committee. And she says that since Jordan seems to have a personal interest in her office, quote, you should consider directing the U.S. DOJ to investigate the racist threats that have come to my staff and me because of this investigation. Renato, your reaction to that blistering letter at nine pages long? Well, look, I, I will just say one thing about Fonnie Willis. Uh, she has a very much take no prisoners uh, attitude. She's, she lays down the law. She sets hard lines. She's done that with Donald Trump. Uh, and now she's doing that with Jim Jordan. And I have to say there's definitely an element here in which she's taking this a little personally. She is sick of all the attacks. 
she's sick of the way in which people are threatening her. And I get it. I, I was threatened myself when I was a prosecutor. I was in protective custody for a period of time. Uh, it is not a fun situation to be in. And so, you know, basically what she's telling Jim Jordan is she's calling him out on the fact that this is really a political game. You know, the United States Congress really has no role, as she points out, in regulating local law enforcement. His, his supposed reason for you know, investigating her is that he wants to see what's happening with federal funds. And her point is that, look, federal funds are being used to, to prosecute yeah. crimes. The fact that you don't like one person I'm prosecuting, the fact that you have a political agenda doesn't mean that I do. And that's exactly where she wants to be. I think that's exactly the sort of strong response that she needs. And frankly, she's calling his bluff. Right. I mean, this letter is very strong. And in fact, she throws his own words back at him. She writes, furthermore, your note calls to mind another letter recently submitted to a House Select Committee. Quote, this unprecedented action serves no legitimate le legislative purpose and would set a dangerous precedent for future Congresses. See letter from Congressman Jim Jordan to Chairman Benny Thompson dated January 9th, 2022. Somya, uh, I would love to get your reaction uh, to uh, D.A. Fonnie Willis's letter. I think it is incredibly well written and methodically refutes the so-called legitimacy of this Jim Jordan inquiry. I think the the ability for the DA, similar to Alvin Bragg in Manhattan, to really try to shut down this inquiry in this public manner by filing a nine-page letter really also educates the uh, country as to what the purpose of a congressional committee should be. And you can juxtapose what Jim Jordan is doing with what the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack did. We had a legislative purpose and we followed that purpose. And Jim mm -hmm. Jordan is certainly not doing that here. Mm -hmm. Hugo, let me bring you into the conversation. Congressional Republicans have made almost their entire agenda centered around playing Donald Trump's legal team and investigating the investigators. Do you think Fonnie Willis's letter will change anything or is Jim Jordan just going to double down? You know, I don't think it's, it's going to change anything. You know, what we should always remember is when congressional Republicans are going after these prosecutors, whether it's uh, Fannie Willis or whether it's Jack Smith, the special counsel, it's uh, in order to help Trump, right? Trump doesn't have a visibility into a lot of these uh, the, the investigations into the indictments, into what prosecutors are thinking. And so what he's effectively doing is getting the House Republican Conference and, and Jim Jordan to do his dirty work for him and to send letters and subpoenas and to try and get some sort of intel uh, from these prosecutors' offices to figure out kind of what's going on and what might, you know, come down the line. I think it was very notable that one of the letters that Jordan sent previously to Fannie Willis was uh, if she had had any contact with federal um, investigators in Jack Smith's office. And that, I think, is a telltale sign that Trump is really just trying to get intel. Mm. And Hugo, there's other news out of Georgia with Trump signaling today he might seek to move his Fulton County case to federal court, but he hasn't actually decided. What's the thought process of Trump's legal team here? Yeah, you know, I checked in with a couple of uh, Trump's lawyers uh, and people in his inner circle, and it seems to be that they are waiting for Mark Meadows, his former chief of staff, to, uh, to see whether or not he can get his case removed to federal court. And they want to see and use Meadows as like a guinea pig, as like a test balloon, to see whether his arguments fly and how kind of a federal judge might react before they jump in and potentially file their mm -hmm. own removal motion themselves. I think to that end, the notice to the judge in uh, Fulton County today that he may soon file a removal motion is more aimed to the judge to say, look, before you decide anything more... Uh, in, in the Fulton County case and whether or not you can have all these co-defendants tried together in October or, you know, if before you make any more deliberations, you should take into account that Trump at some point is going to remove his case to federal court. So then, Renato, what's the likelihood of this judge actually allowing Trump or any of his co-defendants to do that? I think it's very unlikely that Trump would be uh, allowed to remove his case. Mark Meadows has an uphill battle, but he has some things going for him in that uh, he had a, you know, he had a smaller role than Trump. Trump was the ringleader. And there were some elements of this RICO uh, enterprise that did involve some official acts. And so that's really what the judge is an Obama appointee, a good judge. What he's what he's really grappling with here, he doesn't have a lot of precedent. And he's grappling with, well, if there's a small piece of this that was part of his official duties. Is that enough to support removal? I don't think ultimately at the end of the day, the judge is going to conclude that. 
But Meadows is making a calculated risk. And as Hugo said, Trump's team is sort of sitting on the sidelines, waiting to see if Meadows succeeds. If he risks, he wins his gamble, then Trump might be more willing to take a gamble himself. There is a legal theory arguing that Donald Trump is constitutionally disqualified from running for president on grounds that it would violate the 14th Amendment. It's based on a little-known provision that bars people who have engaged in an insurrection from holding government office. It, it isn't just legal scholars kicking this theory around, but also elected officials like Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold, who told Politico there have been conversations among other secretaries as well. The issue has intensified in Griswold's state, where the group Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington filed a lawsuit on behalf of the six voters, four Republicans and two unaffiliated, seeking to remove Trump from the ballot in that state because of his role in the insurrection on January 6th. Joining me now is Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold, who also chairs the Democratic Association of Secretaries of State. Secretary Griswold, thank you for being here. The group seeking to remove Trump from the ballot declares that it would be improper and a breach or neglect of duty for you as Secretary of State to allow his name to appear on any future primary or general election ballots. Talk about the lawsuit and how you plan to address it. Well, first, thank you for having me on. It's always great to see you. Uh, and what we are facing is a lawsuit alleging that Donald Trump is disqualified from the Colorado ballot for inciting the insurrection and trying to steal the election in 2020 from the American people. Now, this is a somewhat novel issue, but there is a provision of the Constitution, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, that clearly states that when someone swears to uphold the Constitution, they are disqualified from office if they engage in insurrection or rebellion or comfort or aid the enemies of the Constitution. So the lawsuit is based on that provision. There is a lot of questions of exactly how that provision works. And that's why I'm so glad to see, a, a, honestly, a lawsuit filed because a court needs to weigh in. You know, Secretary, the 14th Amendment has been publicly has been discussed publicly for a while. But this is a challenge officially filed against Trump. Um, it's also voters who initiated the suit um, that that doesn't fit the profile. Well, the the, the he calls them Trump calls them um, radical left communists. These are the people who Trump's claiming who are behind these charges. But the folks who are bringing, um, bringing suit, or not bringing suit, but the, some of the legal scholars who are pushing this, they're from the Federalist Society. These are conservatives. These aren't radical left communists, right? That's right. And we all know that President Trump is a liar. The voters who brought this suit are Republican and unaffiliated voters. Uh, these are the people who brought this suit. And I think it's an important uh, lawsuit that hopefully will add clarity to election officials all across the nation. There are some things that are very unclear about how the, the uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is enforced. So, for example, if someone is disqualified, are they barred from running for office or just being seated in office? Who gets to make those decisions? How does Colorado law uh, execute the Constitution? These are all really big questions. Um, but to, to the, the point of Donald Trump exaggerates and lies, there's a, a bigger issue that is the basis of the lawsuit. He incited the insurrection and tried to steal the election from the American people. There's a lot of questions about if that affects his ballot access, and that's something that I hope a court will decide and provide guidance to secretaries of state all across the nation, but specifically in the state of Colorado, uh, in, in particular as how that U.S. Co constitutional provision relates to Colorado law. Mm -hmm. Um, Secretary, what are, are other Secretary of State saying about the 14th Amendment question? Is there unanimity, unanimity of agreement or is there some dissension, particularly among maybe um, fellow Democrats? Well, only a handful of secretaries of state have made comments so far. I think maybe five that I'm aware of. 
Um, but I, I think that the bigger picture is that this litigation, this lawsuit may play out over various parts of the presidential election. And for your viewers, uh, just know that this may not be resolved before the primary. This lawsuit may be brought again if Trump is the nominee. It may be brought mm -hmm. again if he wins the presidential election. But no, this is just one lever, one variable that will affect the 2024 election. And what gives me a lot of hope through all of the situation, the attack on democracy, is that Americans themselves will have the opportunity to choose between democracy and chaos yet again. Mm. And they have been deciding uh, to choose democracy over and over and over in recent times. Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold, thank you very much for coming to The Readout. The recent racist violence in Jacksonville, Florida, tragically showed the poisonous fruit of white supremacy in America. As three black people were murdered at a Dollar General store by a white supremacist shooter motivated by what officials called a disgusting ideology of hate. The senseless violence in Jacksonville comes during a nationwide assault on teaching black history, especially in Ron DeSantis's Florida, where his regime has dictated students must learn that some black people gained benefits from slavery and blocked access to advanced placement African-American studies classes. Similarly, Sarah Huckabee Sanders administration in Arkansas says AP African-American studies will no longer be recognized for course credit by the state. Attempts like these to whitewash America's history are aimed directly at efforts to highlight a new start date for the American project, like Nicole Hannah Jones 1619 project. A new book by Robert P. Jones spells out how the roots of white supremacy in America extend even deeper to a little known 15th century Catholic Church doctrine. And I'm joined now by Robert Jones, the president and founder of the Public Religion Research Institute and the author of The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future. Robbie, it's so good to see you. Oh, so good to be here. I want to congratulate you on the book. Here it is. Thank here is you. my copy. Um, and I want you to start by just d explaining to us the doctrine of discovery, mm. which features a lot in the start of the book. Well, I should say that this is something actually fairly new to me, right? So I have a PhD in religion, I studied a lot of uh, American religious history, and this idea of the doctrine of discovery was fairly new. So what it is, is it's a set of 15th century Christian doctrines that were designed to answer the problem of what do we do with all these people we've just encountered in these lands that we didn't know about, right, right. in the 1400s. And so who do they, who do the uh, Christian princes uh, and queens and kings appeal to, but the head of the Christian church? And this is, I should say, um, it is a Catholic doctrine, but this is before the Catholic Protestant split. So it is a Christian doctrine of right. all of Western Europe uh, uh, here. And so they appeal to uh, the religious authority, the Pope, and um, they get a decision ab about what their responsibilities are. And it basically runs like this. It says uh, the defining uh, characteristic is whether or not these people are Christian or not. Uh, if they are not Christian and if they are not already subjugated by a Christian uh, power, then they essentially have no human rights. And the, it goes on to explicitly spell out that they have the right to occupy, conquer, kill, steal their goods. And then this phrase like uh, is like literally in the document, you know, some of these still ring in my head and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. Right. This is in the document from the highest power of the Christian church uh, in, in the late uh, 1400s. And so this is what gives license in their minds to European colonizers to try to enslave indigenous people, to wipe them out if they resist in any way and to enslave Africans. That's how they do it. And still yeah. in their minds advance the interests of Christianity. Uh, that's exactly right. And it's worth remembering, this is the version of Christianity that lands on these shores and then, in fact, motivates the landing um, on these shores. And I think one of the things I've become really convinced of and one of the reasons why I uh, at the heart of this new book is that this idea that this country is intended by God to be a promised land for European Christians is very much still with us.